Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. On Google, I have a podcast, Dwyer Crime. Let's talk about a case that really requires the immediate attention of anyone interested in criminal justice. Rodney Reed is on death row. His execution is set for November the 20th. That's this month. That's just a few days from now. I don't believe Rodney Reed who is scheduled to die, did the crime. <clears throat> Let's talk about the people involved and let's talk about the testimony of witnesses who have come forward to establish certain facts. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to follow the timeline. And I believe by the time we get to the end of the timeline, you're going to find out that this case has several problems that the prosecution, I believe to a reasonable person, did not come close to establishing guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and that other people might be involved, might have admitted to others their involvement. Let's talk about it. The murder victim is 19-year-old white woman, Stacy Stites. Right? She's 19 at the time she's killed. Her fiancé, with whom she lived, Jimmy Fennell, was also a police officer. The defendant who was convicted of the crime is Rodney Reed. He's the black guy currently on death row. Now let's be up front. Right? Let's be balanced here. A number of women in the area have accused Rodney Reed, who hasn't been convicted of sexual assault, of exactly that. Now, while he's never been convicted, you need to be aware that these accusations have been made. Right? Some of the women making these accusations were white. The accusations include an alleged sexual assault on a 12-year-old girl. Some of the women testified during the penalty phase of Reed's death penalty trial. So be aware that serious sexual assault allegations were made by third parties not involved in this murder case against the defendant. Now let's talk about what took place before Stacy was murdered. Jimmy Fennell, the police officer fiance of Stacy Stites, had concerns that he confided to his friend Charles Wayne Fletcher who was in law enforcement. In fact, Fletcher worked as a deputy with the Bishop County Sheriff's Office. Right? We know about Fennell's statements from a very good source. Fletcher himself. Right? This is a deputy talking about the private conversation he had with the murder victim's fiance before the murder took place. Right? In Mr. Fletcher's words. Right? And he had been with Stacy and with Fennell. Stacy then leaves and Fennell gives the statement. Right? According to Fletcher, after Stacy left, I remember clearly that Jimmy said that he believed Stacy was and I'm going to edit here. Effing and N. Right? My words, you figure out what the abbreviations are for. Right? Fletcher continues. He did not say specifically how he knew that or what made him believe it. 
But I remember he said those words because I was disturbed by them. Right? So we know. We know. From a member of the law enforcement community with whom Fennell confided that before Stacy Stites is murdered, Fennell, rightly or wrongly, believed that she was intimately involved with a black man. So, let's go to the morning of April the 23rd, 1996. Stacy Stites is living with her fiancé, Jimmy Fennell. She's living in the nearby town of Giddings, about 30 minutes northeast of Basham, in an apartment with Fennell. She works in a grocery store and she has a very early shift that requires her to get to the store by 3.30 in the morning. Right now, Fennell is with Stites in the apartment, but he's not awake when she leaves to go to work, according to him. Right? She leaves, we believe, at approximately 3 a.m. Their apartment, by the way, in the investigation of this death penalty murder case, was never searched by law enforcement. Even though Fennell was the last person other than whoever did this, if someone else did this, to have seen the murder victim alive. So, she leaves the apartment to go to work at around 3 a.m. in the morning in Fennell's pickup truck. Several hours later, Fennell's pickup truck was found in the parking lot of Bishop High School. Stacy Stites is not in the vehicle. She did not make it to work. Her body is found that afternoon several miles outside of town. Right? Her body is found on the side of a country road just outside Bishop, Texas, which is about a half an hour east of Austin. Now let's talk about the body. She's partially clothed. She's lying face up. There's a mark on her neck that looks like she's been strangled. There's a braided belt near her body that may have been used to strangle her. Right? There are markings on her neck that apparently match the braided belt. Now this is America. The stakes don't get higher than a death penalty murder case. We want truth and justice. That's the purpose, quite frankly, of my YouTube videos here online. But yet, the piece of braided belt found next to the murder victim has never been tested for DNA. Folks, how is that possible? Is there a more relevant piece of evidence? Understand, this is a belt the prosecution believes was used to strangle the victim. Whoever's DNA is on that belt, that would make that person a suspect. Now if Rodney Reed's DNA is not on the belt, then in my opinion, he should not be a suspect. If someone else's DNA is on that belt, then law enforcement should look at them. My question for the politicians who have the power to step in to delay the execution of Rodney Reed is simply, why hasn't this braided belt been tested for DNA? 
if we're looking for who did this crime, if we want to get rid of any doubts we have post-conviction, don't we owe it to the victim's family and to the constitutional rights of the defendant to have this braided belt fully tested for DNA? We have the technology today. Let's also pause right here for a moment to discuss the pickup truck evidence. Fingerprints lifted from the pickup truck that the murder victim allegedly drove on her way to work that morning. Match the murder victim and match her husband. Would it surprise you to know that the guy who's on death row, who's scheduled to be executed in a few days, hasn't been matched to any of the fingerprints found on the pickup truck? The one that whoever did this crime then drove to Bishop High School after the crime was committed. Well, let's continue to. The police, acting on a hunch, talk with Rodney Reed. They compare Rodney Reed's DNA to sperm found in Stacy Stites' body. Apparently three spermazoa were found in Stacy's body. At first, Rodney Reed claimed he did not know Stacy Stites. Right? He then later admits when the sperm matches that he had an affair with her. That the two of her uh, that the two of them had sex two days before her body was found. Now what I want people to do right here is to think about the prosecution's theory of the case. Ask yourself whether this is believable. Stites leaves her apartment around 3 a.m. and is driving toward Bashup. Along the way, apparently on foot, because there is an evidence of another vehicle, Right, whoever did this takes the pickup from Stacy, if you believe the prosecution's theory, and then drives it to Bashup High School. So apparently on foot, Rodney Reed somehow is able to stop Stacy in her pickup truck and is able to attack her. Right? Somehow he's able to do this without leaving a single fingerprint in the truck. He's able to rape and strangle her. Now here we have to speculate a bit. Because of course the braided belt used in the strangulation has never been tested for DNA. Then he dumps her body. Right? All of this happens outside of town in the wilderness. Then of course he drives the truck to the school. Nobody sees him get out of the vehicle. Nobody sees him driving the truck. And of course he leaves the truck in the high school area and walks away. Right? Even though he's on foot again, nobody sees him. The prosecution has another claim. And this one has been thoroughly debunked. By science. According to the prosecution's witnesses, right, the three intact spermazoa that were recovered from Stites meant that she had had sex with Rodney Reed no more than 24 hours prior to her death. Right? Well, we know it's junk science. Understand, numerous experts have come forward, including pathologist Cyril Wack. In other words, elite pathologists have come forward and have noted that this is simply not true. That what Rodney Reed told 
authorities that he had had sex two days before could be accurate. The idea that all the sperm die off in 24 hours is simply unfounded. It's junk science. Well, more importantly, and I consider this to be key, the lividity, the blood pooling around murder victim Stacy Stites's body doesn't match up with the prosecution's timeline. Right? Understand, according to pathologists who have looked at this case, it's clear from Stacy's body that she was murdered before midnight and then dumped in the woods the following morning. Right? Understand, lividity takes at least four hours to set in. The position of her body slumped forward one arm outstretched indicates that she wasn't killed where her body was found. Her body's in an unnatural position. The blood pooling doesn't fit the timeline. In other words, pathologists are claiming that Stacy died when she was in the apartment with her fiance Fennell. If she died before midnight, she would have been with Fennell in the apartment they share. So according to an Intercept article, that's available online, and it's an excellent article written by Jordan Smith. The police then questioned Fennell, who fails not one polygraph test, he fails two polygraph tests, including when he's asked if he strangled Stacy. So, that brings us to her funeral. Now understand, you have another member of law enforcement. I mentioned Fletcher earlier who claims that before Stacy is murdered, her fiancé suspected that she was sleeping with a black man. Right? That, that's before. That's before. Rodney Reed claims to have been having an affair with her. Well, now Stacy's been murdered. It's her funeral. At the funeral is a sheriff's deputy in Giddings, Jim Clampett, right? This is your second law enforcement witness in the case. Now, I'm just going to read from The Intercept's article, right? And I'll paraphrase a little bit, right? Clampett recalled standing in the doorway of the viewing room as Fennell stood before the casket. Here's Clampett's quote. He's made this quote in a sworn affidavit. In other words, this quote is from Clampett under penalty of perjury. And understand, Clampett is in law enforcement. There'd be career repercussions if he's lying in any kind of legal proceeding. At that moment, Jimmy, that's Jimmy Fresnel, said something I will never forget. This is while Jimmy's looking at his fiance's body. Right? Something along the lines of, you got what you deserved. Jimmy was directing his comment at Miss Stites's body. I was completely shocked. Well, let's go further. So now it's three months after Stacy's death. Fennell has moved on. 
He's now dating a woman named Pam Duncan. Now understand, she has submitted an affidavit. She claims that Fennell became, her words, possessive and jealous of her. So, you determine if this is normal behavior. After she broke it off with him, he would drive by her house night after night, her words, night after night, shining a spotlight through the windows and standing outside screaming, here, here are her words again, bitch and other names. Right, this is the woman who Fennell dates after Stacy has been murdered. So, if you believe Fennell is someone who should have been a person of interest, just understand that he would later plead guilty to kidnapping and sexual assault. Right? Understand. Connie Lair accused him of raping her at gunpoint against the back of his patrol car while he was on duty and in uniform. Right? Understand. Fennell was sentenced to 10 years. He was released from prison in the fall of 2018. So, just to understand, there's a paucity of evidence against Rodney Reed. If you believe the witnesses, right? If you believe the law enforcement witnesses. Fennell tells one member of law enforcement before the murder that he suspected his fiance of sleeping with a black man. Guess what? She ends up dead? There's no evidence the black man was in the pickup truck at the scene of the crime. Right? No evidence. None whatsoever. Not only that, if the victim's headed to work and has to get to work at 3.30 in the morning, I'm sorry, it's too far outside the range of reason that some black guy would be out in the wilderness by the road as she's driving into Basham and is able to stop her vehicle without leaving any forensic evidence. So then, of course, the black guy, without knowing about the earlier conversation the fiancé had with the law enforcement friend, right? The black guy says, hey, I was having an affair with her. By the way, there are people out there who claim to have seen them together, right? There are people out there who claim to have known that they were romantically involved. So, of course, the black guy, Rodney Reed's statements to law enforcement are consistent with Fennell's statements to Fletcher. So, of course, the police, and keep in mind, they're supposed to have an open mind. They're supposed to go wherever the evidence takes them. In this case, somewhere along the line, a decision was made not to test the braided belt next to the body that's curiously positioned for DNA. Somewhere along the line, a decision was made while they're investigating Rodney Reed, while Fennell is failing lie detector tests not to search the couple's apartment. Then, of course, Fennell shows up. His fiance has been brutally murdered. There's a member of law enforcement at the funeral. 
who hears him telling the corpse of his fiancée, you got what you deserved. This is all before, of course. Fennell is shining lights and showing up to the woman he dates after Fennell's death, calling her terrible names, according to her. Right? Don't just judge the evidence, folks. Judge the quality of the evidence. Then, of course, there's the woman who accuses him of rape, and Fennell has to plead guilty. And, of course, you should know there are other women who claim Fennell mistreated them. Let me close by saying this. While Fennell was in prison, there's a member of the Aryan Brotherhood who's come forward. He claims that Fennell wanted their help, wanted their protection while he was in prison. Right? As they're talking with Fennell, right, as this individual's talking with Fennell, and granted, this individual's an inmate in prison. He's a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. He claims that Fennell confessed to the murder. Right now, I don't think the Aryan Brotherhood has suddenly decided to help black guys on death row. It's possible that this inmate is coming forward hoping to get more leniency on their sentence. Maybe they feel that this publicized case might actually give them you know, some good marks with the parole board. Whatever the motivation. What I want you to do is to leave this video thinking about the legal standard. Did the prosecution here meet its legal burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? Can you consider getting beyond a reasonable doubt when there's no fingerprints of the defendant on the pickup truck that the prosecution theory has the killer driving away from the scene of the crime. When there are no eyewitnesses, none whatsoever, who saw the defendant leave the pickup truck. Folks, there's no evidence that the defendant was ever in the pickup truck. Right, none. Also, can you get to, beyond a reasonable doubt, when you have pathologists looking at the body and questioning whether or not the murder victim was even killed where the prosecution claims? At the time the prosecution claims she was killed, how also do you get to, beyond a reasonable doubt, when you have law enforcement members coming forward and saying, look, you know, the fiancé thought she might be involved with a black guy before her body was ever discovered. Before the defendant ever says, I was having an affair with her. So the red flags are out on this case. A lot of people have done a lot of great work on this case. Locating witnesses, getting pathologists like Cyril Weck involved, having the file reviewed, pointing to the inconsistencies in the record. The key here is that we get it right. It would be an American tragedy if an innocent man is put to death for a crime he did not commit. It is my hope that the governor of Texas is going to order DNA testing on the braided belt. 
right? If Rodney Reed's DNA is not on that braided belt, then I believe he should be released from custody. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Pay close attention here to the execution date. Right? It's simply mind-blowing to me that we have technology like DNA technology today. And in some states, it's just not used automatically. It's simply incredible to me that you could have a situation like this where the fiancé is, is later convicted of kidnapping, of sexually assaulting a woman against his police car, and that this case hasn't gotten further scrutiny with further testing. It just doesn't make sense. Let me say this too. If Rodney Reed is outside of Basham, on foot at three in the morning. Where's his car? Why would he <laughs> why would he be miles outside of Bashup on foot in the darkness at three in the morning? Isn't the prosecution theory one that doesn't even pass the common sense test? Then he's out there, what, wearing gloves? How's he able to leave no fingerprints? Understand, his fingerprints aren't found on the body of the murder victim. Right? It's just old, biased thinking that had the prosecution, in my opinion, overlooked the possibility that he may have been having an affair with the murder victim. Understand, members of her family have come forward and have said they believe the two were romantically involved. So this case deserves your attention. Let's hope the powers that be do the right thing. At a minimum, they need to test the braided belt for DNA. That's at a minimum. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you feel that I have mischaracterized any part of this case, if you feel there's other evidence that the public should know about, then I hope you leave those comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.